We will develop a simple multiplicative model for subthreshold current that will help us understand how to combat it. So let's just start developing a, an analytical model for subthreshold conduction. So subthreshold current is actually a drift current that flows between the drain and the source. The only difference is it flows at uh, VGS below V threshold. So we should treat it the same way we treat the uh, drift current that flows above threshold voltage and IDS. Um, let's just deal with uh, absolute amounts. I don't want to care about directions. It's going to be uh, Q inversion times W times the velocity of electrons. And so uh, it's just the same equation for drift current that we have always been using. Uh, IDS is obviously directly proportional to the amount of inversion charge in the channel. That makes sense. And um, in the channel of an NMOS, the amount of inversion charge is uh, the uh, electron concentration. So it's basically Q in is basically uh, Q times N, where N is the concentration of electrons at the surface. Now, the concentration of electrons anywhere is proportional to e to the power of EF minus EI over KT, where EF is the Fermi level and EI is the intrinsic Fermi level. This comes from integrating uh, the Fermi Dirac statistics uh, multiplied by the density of states over the entire conduction band, and it's an approximation actually. So now let's assume that we are in a situation where the uh, band bending at the surface of, of the semiconductor is like this, and we apply more uh, gate voltage. As I described in the pre previous video, um, in weak inversion, the difference between weak inversion and strong inversion is that in weak inversion, when we apply more gate potential, some of that gate potential, some of that delta V uh, goes to the uh, substrate and some of it definitely goes to the oxide but some of it will go to the substrate and so what we will see is more bending in all the bands the conduction band the valence band and the uh, intrinsic Fermi level so we see here a delta EI uh, an increase in the bending of the intrinsic Fermi level and so if we assume that the original situation was this situation, and let's call this N old, so this is the old concentration of electrons, applying more gate potential leads to an, an N new, which is definitely going to be more than N old because we have uh, applied more bending and so made the surface more N type. N new is going to be proportional to e to the power of EF minus EI plus delta EI divided by KT. Now, the subthreshold current is equal to uh, Q times W times VN, and Q is obviously Q uh, small, the charge of an electron, multiplied by N, the concentration of electrons, and then times W VN. Now, in the old situation, this situation, and the new situation, this situation, the charge of the electron Q and the width of the channel W and the uh, velocity of electrons, especially when we are assuming velocity saturation, are all the same. And therefore, the ratio between um, N, uh, between I new and I old is also the ratio between N new and N old. That's the only difference we have. And so the only difference is uh, in the concentration of electrons, and all we have to do is divide these two uh, exponentials uh, by each other, which gives us e to the power of minus delta ei by kt. And so you start to see now a multiplicative relationship for subthreshold conduction, uh, which says that if we apply band bending to the bands of of the, the, the silicon so that we have a delta EI total bending, the current will uh, increase by the amount e to the power of minus delta EI by KT. This is not very useful because, of course, we are interested in uh, a current relationship that relates current to externally applied voltages. Delta EI is an internal energy uh, uh, bending in the bands of silicon, which is not something we can see at the circuit level, and so this is not a useful model as it stands.
And so the, the first step in, in transforming this relationship into a relationship that is uh, something we can actually use is to realize that uh, delta EI is related to uh, the potential developed at the surface of the substrate. So this amount of energy is related to an amount of potential through Q. So delta EI is equal to minus Q times Vs, where S here stands for surface. So this is the amount of potential at the surface of the substrate. It, it does not refer to the source. So be careful with this S here. And so we reach the first uh, useful equation we can uh, look at, which is IDS new is equal to IDS old multiplied by e to the power of delta Vs divided by kT over q. This is still not very useful because what is IDS old and what is IDS new? This is, you know, it's a multiplicative relationship, but it's not it doesn't have a reference point that is very useful. Also, what is delta Vs? Delta Vs is the amount of extra surface potential that we see at the surface of the substrate. That is not something that is externally measurable. It's, it's not a quantity that we can see at the circuit level. So we still have to develop this model a little bit further. To develop it, we, I'm just going to sketch a MOSFET real quick. So we have the uh, source and the drain, and there is a weak channel in between them. Um, this is the body terminal, and uh, we have a gate separated from the channel by the oxide. So there is a depletion region, there is a weak channel somewhere around here, and there is a depletion region around the weak channel. So this is a depletion zone. Um, there are two capacitors that exist here between the gate and the body. So if you want to connect the gate to the body, there are actually two capacitances here. The first is the capacitance from the gate to the weak channel through the oxide, and this is called C oxide. And the second is a capacitance from the weak channel to the uh, body through the depletion zone, and we call this C depletion, C dep, right? And so the charge on the channel, the charge in the channel, is actually coupled to it through these two capacitors. It's coupled to it through an interaction between these two capacitors, between C oxide and C depletion, right? And in fact, if you, um, if you think of, of, of an additional delta VGS, right, assume that we apply an extra delta VGS, we apply an extra uh, gate to source voltage. The S here refers to source, right? So this is going to be divided between these two capacitors using a capacitive divider, right? And so what is delta Vs? What is the share of the substrate from this delta Vgs? So an amount of potential is going to fall upon C oxide. This is delta V oxide. And the rest is going to fall on the C dep, and this is delta Vs, where S here refers to surface. And we are interested in this delta Vs in terms of delta Vgs. So how much is delta Vs? Delta Vs is going to be delta Vgs multiplied by C oxide over C oxide plus C depletion. And of course, delta V oxide is going to be delta Vgs multiplied by C depletion divided by C oxide. Now, the quantity C oxide by uh, C oxide plus C depletion is called 1 over eta, and therefore this is delta Vgs over eta. Eta is useful. It's, a, it's a, a unitless quantity, and it's related to the technology, and it's basically 1 plus the ratio between the depletion capacitance and the oxide capacitance. And it is extremely effective in determining um, the amount of, um, of subthreshold conduction that we have. Now we can actually write a useful relationship for subthreshold current because taking this equation, which related IDS new and IDS old through delta Vs, and taking this equation, which relates delta Vs to delta Vgs, we can write IDS new is equal to IDS old multiplied by e to the power of q delta Vgs over kT. And so we finally have a relationship between subthreshold current and uh, externally applied VGS. And we now know that the relationship is exponential. And so basically, if you have a certain current at V threshold and 
you apply a negative VGS, so that uh, a negative delta VGS, so that VGS decreases, the decrease will be exponential. And the speed of the exponential decrease is going to be related. Actually, there's an eta here. This is very important. It's going to be related to temperature through kT over Q, which is uh, the uh, thermal uh, potential, and also through eta. Now, we have to get rid of this multiplicative relationship, not get rid of it. We have to uh, standardize it by measuring it against something useful. And the most useful reference point for us is the current measured at the threshold voltage, which we call I threshold. Specifically, I threshold will be the current measured at threshold voltage for the minimum sized transistor. So this is for a transistor whose size is W over L equals 1 and for, for which W and L are both uh, the minimum possible dimension. So our uh, I-threshold is uh, dependent on technology, completely determined by it, but we are talking about um, a few hundred nanoamperes um, would, be, uh, would be a reasonable number to expect. Now, um, this allows us to write the uh, sub-threshold current in terms of I-threshold, because I-sub-threshold will be I-threshold, but this has to be scaled up by the size of the transistor, so W over L, because I threshold is measured for the minimum size transistor. This is also, I threshold is measured at V threshold, and so we have to multiply by E to the power of VGS minus V threshold over eta KT over Q. Now, at VGS equal V threshold, the current is going to be W over L I threshold. And the other point of interest to us is current at VGS equals zero, because we can more or less define this current as our off current. And so I off is going to be equal to W over L I threshold e to the power of minus V threshold divided by eta KT over Q. So if you have a transistor that you consider off because you have applied VGS equals zero to it, this is the current that will be flowing through it. This current could be large or it could be small. This depends on two things. It depends on the value of I threshold. It obviously depends on the size of the transistor, and it also depends on how fast the current drops. So I threshold is an important factor because, um, but it's actually fully determined by technology and you can rest assured that people are doing their best to control it. W over L is actually a little bit tricky because you shouldn't look at W over L and think of it as increasing uh, um, off current. It is increasing off current, but it's not increasing the ratio between off current and on current, which is what you should be, what you should care about. A larger transistor is going to carry a larger off current, but it's also going to carry an equally larger on current. Uh, that doesn't mean that size doesn't matter. It does matter, especially in dynamic circuits where large transistors can uh, leak away a lot of the charge. But um, this is not the main issue. The main issue is actually in this power, in the, uh, uh, in the power we have here. It's actually in the whole power because V-threshold itself also affects the uh, amount of, of, of leakage that we observe. L let's just think about it for a second. Now, if uh, V-threshold defined as the point at which the current is I-threshold for a minimum size transistor is here and the rate of drop is like this and another transistor has a V-threshold that is larger as again defined by the point at which I threshold, uh, we measure I threshold, and the rate of, of drop is, is the same, we're going to observe a smaller off current for the second transistor. So one way in which you can actually decrease subthreshold current is increasing your threshold voltage. But the problem with increasing th the threshold voltage is that it reduces the quantity VGS minus V threshold. And this quantity is extremely important because Regardless of the uh, mechanism that causes your on, uh, your on current to flow, whether it is pinch off or velocity saturation or velocity overshoot, this quantity shows up in the current because this quantity is responsible for the amount of charge that is coupled to the channel. And therefore, if you reduce this quantity, you reduce the amount of on current you have and therefore increase your delay. And that is not acceptable. So the best way to manage subthreshold conduction is to manage how fast it drops. So at the same threshold voltage, uh, 
we want it to drop faster. And dropping faster is going to depend on the rest of the power, not on V threshold, but on eta kT over Q. kT over Q is determined by operating temperature, and so cooling the system will definitely help, but, you know, that's not very practical often. You know, we, we have a hard time dealing with heat as it is. Um, it's not actually an easy thing to push for. So what really matters is eta. Eta is the begin all and end all of trying to control subthreshold conduction. And again, eta is 1 plus C, C depletion over C oxide. It's the, basically the ratio between uh, depletion uh, capacitance and oxide capacitance. And it, um, let's just look at one way to rewrite this, uh, the current equation. So um, the the current, the I of current, the current at VGS equals zero, is W over L I threshold e to the power of minus Q V threshold over eta KT. Uh, another way to write it is to write it in powers of 10 instead of uh, powers of Euler's number. So you could have it as W over L times I threshold, 10 to the power of minus V threshold over S. So we are just we have just uh, changed the, the, the base of, of the exponent from e to 10, right? And uh, S is actually defined as 60 eta millivolt. And so it just comes from the transformation of e to 10, which gives you a, a, a natural logarithm. This gives you the 60. Um, and you also have to do this at room temperature to get the number 60. But it, 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 it ends up at being 60 eta, right? And as we will see in the next video, S is the uh, parameter that captures everything about how, um, how well the subthreshold behavior of the transistor is. It represents how fast the current rolls off, rolls off below uh, threshold voltage. There's one thing I want, I want to uh, point out about eta. So eta is the ratio between, basically the ratio between C depletion and C oxide. Forget about the one for a second. And uh, when we looked at this modeling for uh, what the charge in the uh, weak inversion channel, we found that it was a capacitive divider between C depletion and C oxide, which gave us uh, eta through this uh, voltage divider. But this assumes, this make, makes a, a dangerous assumption. It makes an assumption that C depletion is constant. And C depletion is not constant in weak inversion. If you are familiar with devices, you should raise this objection. In weak inversion, the depth of the depletion region is variable. And so C depletion should be a nonlinear capacitance. But re the reality is in most modern transistors, we use something called steep retrograde doping. In steep retro retrograde doping, the depth of the depletion region is capped to a certain value, even in weak inversion. And so you can actually consider the value of C depletion to be a constant value, and everything we did here is okay.